welcome to Songs for the Struggling Artist, the podcast, the blogcast. This is episode 25, and um, I am very much behind myself in terms of uh, podcasting. It's been, I don't know, a few weeks. Is it a month? Couldn't tell you, but a while. I am. It's been... It's been hard to get motivated to, to do this because it's been hard to get motivated to do pretty much everything. Um, I'm still reeling from election terrors. And uh, yeah, so it's hard to, hard to stay on top of like, oh, it's so important to record this podcast that only a handful of lovely people listen to. Thank you very much for listening, by the way, those of you that are, so thank you for that. Um, I have only managed to blog a little bit because I have already written stuff, so like it's like in the, the cooker, um, but I think in a couple of months there's going to be a real there's going to be a real dry spell because I I stopped writing for a little chunk here. Um, I I do have in the in the cooker some some stuff I've written recently. Where I'm finally like able to address some of the stuff that's going on in the world. Uh, but I'm not quite ready for for publishing, typing, sharing. Podcasting, blogcasting, blogging, ba 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 ba. Not 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 quite there yet. So this one today is one that got written a while ago. I think it was October, maybe September. Ah, those those good old days before the world went to shit. Um, it. Uh, yeah, so so this is part two, actually, of a blog that I wrote even before that, um, and actually the last blog cast. So last time I did a blog cast, it was um, on the discomfort of being different, and after I wrote that one, I felt like there was something else that that I that wanted to be said about it. Um, so I wrote part two, and that's what this blog cast is going to be, is part two of the discomfort of being different. Um, there are other blogs that have been written in the meantime, but I will come back to them, maybe. <laughs> um, it also, it, this, the, I just published this, sec, this part two a few days ago, and, um, and, and it just seemed like, oh, I may as well do part two after part one in the blog cast world, so... It's happening in that order because of that. Uh, so, without further ado, adieu, adieu, here's the discomfort of being different, part two. Occasionally, right after I push publish on my blog, I get a flood of additional ideas on the topic. I start to think of ways I should edit it or concepts I want to add. Sometimes I'll go back in and edit or add, other times I'll just let it lie. And sometimes I need to continue the thought in an entirely new blog post. And sometimes I need to continue the thought in an entirely new blog post. That's what happened when I opened up the floodgates on sexism in theater. Thoughts just kept rushing in and I had to write follow-up post after follow-up. Some of those were based on the feedback I was getting, and some of it was the swirl of it all, marinating in my brain. This post is of the marination variety. In thinking about being different from the social science around nonconformity to my own history, I realized that there was an additional factor that I didn't factor in to my initial thoughts on the subject. That factor, in my case, was gender. Because, in theater, as in almost everywhere else, the best way to be the same, the best way to conform, is to be a middle-class white man. The numbers mean that nine times out of ten when I'm in a theater doing someone else's show, I'm in the minority. I am already different, just by being born a woman. And because of that, there is an added pressure to fit in. 
to do things the way they've always been done. Working female directors, all 22% of them, mostly make their names directing plays about men. Women playwrights get more productions if their plays are about men. In order to assimilate, one has to take on the dominant culture, and that culture is male and white. This all applies to, applies to right, blah, blah. This all applies to race, too, but I will save that post either for someone else or for the moment after I push publish on this one. What this all adds up to for me is the sense that I'm already a foot behind in the fitting in game. And it is tricky to be perceived as the nonconformist I am rather than the woman who doesn't know the rules because she's a woman. There is a presumption right at the outset that I don't know what I'm doing based on my gender. There are theater companies who will baldly state that they don't hire women. So if I'm doing the job of directing, for example, I'm expected to be too feminine, to be doing things wrong. There's a sense that I should be doubly aggressive to make up for my gender. The fact that I refuse to do this has been a problem throughout my career, and I think it's a problem throughout the culture too. We lose so much potential by leaving out the female experience of leadership. Jill Soloway's work on the female gaze is the first time in my decades on the planet that I have ever heard a woman in a position of prominence able to advocate for a female aesthetic and style of leadership. It is incredibly inspiring and incredibly unusual. It requires a great deal of tolerance of that discomfort of doing things differently. Soloway asks her camera operators to feel with her subjects. She hires a crew that can cry. I can only begin to imagine how the established film crew guys react to that. What I don't know is how she manages those confused and angry folks used to doing things the usual way. That is the trick I'd like to ma learn to master. I think a lot of that finessing of the world around one comes with age. The older I get, the lesser, the less I care about what other people think. That is, the desire to fit in has begun to diminish dramatically. At the moment, I'm still straddling the line. I'm not yet able to wholly reject a dominant culture, probably because I'm not really part of it. Soloway, having already achieved traditional success in film and TV, has the credentials to tell the patriarchy to go fuck itself. She can say something as radical as, men should just stop making movies and make space for women's voices. And while I'm sure that blowback is intense, she can perhaps watch it roll by from the top of the heap. I'm still hoping to make a little mark, and it is hard to do from the fringes. So, time, I hope, will help me to tolerate more and more the feeling of my own differences. Every decade I live, I lose more of that people-pleasing shame that limits me now. There we have it. Part two. Part, yeah, next part. Maybe there'll be a part three. Who knows? We'll do a endless sequel of discomfort of being different posts. Ooh. <laughs> there will probably be a lot of that in the in the current world. Um, yeah. So thanks for listening, and thank you uh, for reading the blog. With those of you who read the blog, thank you for listening to this podcast. Whether you're listening to it on SoundCloud or on iTunes, if you're on iTunes, um, do me a favor and click on uh, the stars on iTunes. I, I, have, I, I have it on authority, some, someone's authority, probably other podcasts' authority, that clicking um, the stars on iTunes makes a difference in terms of helping other people find the podcast. Um, so do that. You can write a review if you want to. Um, say nice things. I'm sensitive. <laughs> and um, if you... Um, are listening on SoundCloud. Thank you. Welcome. And uh, thanks for the likes and the and the clicks and the plays. Um, and I also just want to thank my patrons on Patreon. Um, they are with me for so many different things and, and they have been um, just, it's just great to have, have cheerleaders who have my back. Um, even if it's just it's just like knowing they're there and, and, and having their, their support. And anyway, so thanks to, to Patreon patrons. 
and to everyone listening, these are the these are the times that try men's souls, and especially the ladies. These are the times that try the ladies' souls as well. Um, so anyway, here is a song for you. This is another uh, lullaby, um, and this was a, a, a song from my childhood. Um, so when I first recorded the lullaby stuff, I pulled this one from my much beloved um, Simon Sisters Sing for Children. Um, they put this poem to music. It's called Pavan for the Nursery. And here it is, my version of Pavan for the Nursery. Now touch the air softly, step gently, one, two. I'll love you till roses are robin's egg blue. I'll love you till gravel is eaten for bread and lemons are orange and lavender's red. Now touch the air softly, swing gently the broom. I'll love you till windows are all of a room. And the table is laid, and the table is bare, and the ceiling reposes on bottomless air. I love you till heaven rips the stars from his coat, and the moon rose away in a glass bottomed boat. And Orion steps down like a diver below, and earth is ablaze, and ocean aglow. So touch the air softly, and swing the broom high. We'll dust the gray mountains, and sweep the blue sky. And I'll love you as long as the fur of the plow. 